My name is John Moorhead, and this is the Multi-Faith Matters podcast. I am privileged today to have as my guest, Andrew DeCourt. Andrew, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? You are. Awesome. Uh, Andrew is, uh, I just have a little bit of bio, and you can supplement this. Uh, Andrew is a lecturer on religious and political ethics and Ethiopian studies. He's the author of Bonhoeffer's New Beginning, Ethics After Devastation, He founded the Institute for Faith and Flourishing and co-directs the Neighbor Love Movement. He has a forthcoming book titled Why Pray? And today we're going to be talking about uh, an article that uh, he did that uh, is currently out um, at uh, foreignpolicy.com on Christian nationalism in Ethiopia, which is a fascinating topic. So we're going to talk about that. And then at the end of our conversation, we're going to talk talk a little bit about his uh, forthcoming book, Why Pray? and unpack that and help promote it. So uh, Andrew, welcome to the podcast. I'm delighted to be here, John. Thanks for your hospitality. Well, it's been great to to learn about your work. It was, uh, I've done a couple of podcasts previously with a philosopher on his books on dehumanization, and he uh, posted a link to your article, which is how I found it. But before we dive into that and unpack it some, what is your background and how did you come become involved in work in Ethiopia? Yeah, I, John, thank you. I'm a passionate follower of Jesus. I grew up reading the Bible and was deeply inspired by the prophet's call to love the orphan and the widow and Jesus' call to love the neighbor and the enemy. And so I was a student at Wheaton College studying philosophy and theology, and I went to Ethiopia to do an internship at a social center with impoverished women and children called the Mercy Center. And after I graduated from Wheaton, my Ethiopian hosts invited me to come back and help launch a new church in Ethiopia. And um, during that year, there was a public protest after an election and a public massacre of around 200 people. And that event really, uh, it really touched my conscience about how silent we Christians can sometimes be about the suffering of our neighbors and injustices that happen in public life. And so that inspired me to go to the University of Chicago and dive deep into the historical tradition of Christian ethical thought on public life. And that that focused on the thought of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and how do we start over when our lives and our societies have been devastated. After that, I returned to Ethiopia and became a professor of public theology at the Ethiopian Graduate School of Theology. And again, at that time, John, there was uh, just escalating violence, escalating arrests and killings taking place in Ethiopia. And that really uh, promote, started, started the work of the neighbor love movement. And th- this is a movement to inspire Ethiopian young people to see others as neighbors rather than enemies. And so we've traveled all around the country and promoted a vision of the other as a neighbor through Jewish perspectives, Moses, love your neighbor as yourself, from Christian perspectives, Jesus, love your your enemy, Prophet Muhammad, be good to neighbors near and far and from just democratic perspectives. Um, so I've had a long journey in Ethiopia, I'm married to an Ethiopian, and I'm deeply grateful for the people of Ethiopia and love the country. Well, it's great to learn more about your work. Um, I was, uh, I don't know if pleasantly surprised is the right word. I I was surprised to see this treatment on Christian nationalism in in Ethiopia. As I mentioned before we started the podcast, I have been following uh, with great concern the challenge of Christian nationalism in the American context and to find out that it's taking place in Ethiopia. uh, I wanted to learn more. And my hope is that listeners and viewers uh, can consider what's going on in Ethiopia and also use that as a way of reflection to consider their own context and what might be going on here and what those challenges are. Uh, To dive into what you wrote, can you talk a little bit and summarize uh, Ethiopia's religious history and how it relates to this issue? Mm -hmm. So John, I think that historical perspectives are really important. Um, history helps us understand what's going on today. I think it was uh, maybe Faulkner who said that the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. And when we go back and look at Christian history, we see this very striking pattern of Christian nationalism. Um, We could call it Christian imperialism. There's different words that we can use, but at the heart of it is the basic idea that God is on our side 
that God has justified our ruler and, and thus that we are destined for a greatness that comes often at the cost of other people's suffering. And so we've seen this in the Roman Empire in the early fourth century, Constantine uh, formally converted the empire to Christianity. He did something extremely significant. He started using Jesus' cross as a symbol of the Roman military. It started appearing on Roman flags and Mo Roman shields. And this central symbol that Jesus chose as an image of self-sacrifice, of nonviolence, of God's redemptive love, started to become a tool of promoting the idea that God is on our side and God will help defeat our enemies. Now, right around the same time as Constantine's uh, so-called conversion of the Roman Empire, we see a similar conversion taking place in Ethiopia. Um, so around 330, the Emperor Izana famously converted um, the Aksumite Empire to Christianity. Aksumite Empire was one of the early uh, civilizational spaces in Ethiopia. And previous to his conversion, John, he, he, there are all of these coins and inscriptions about Izana's rule, and he called himself the son of the war god Maharem. Um, this was an ancient form of justifying your rule by claiming to be God's child. And after his conversion, Izana started calling himself the servant of Christ. Now, this may sound like a really good thing for, for us Christians. I'm a very passionate Christian. Um, but what we observe in Isana's inscriptions and other surviving evidence is that his pattern of ruling, like he did when he was the war god's son, continued when he claimed to be the servant of Christ. And we continue to see domination, intimida intimidation, and violence. But now, now in the name of Jesus, and when we start um, tracing the history of Ethiopia's rulers, we continue to see this pattern of the rulers that God has a special relationship with them, makes this untouchable, and that this justifies their violence in expanding their empire, or what we would call the states, um, even when it would come to massacres and to uh, severe oppression and horrific atrocities, uh, like burning villages and drowning people alive and committing torture. And this really reaches its clearest expression in, in 1931 and 1955 in Ethiopia under a ruler named Haile Selassie. Uh, maybe, maybe some people have heard of Haile Selassie. He is central to Rastafarianism. He's a very famous international figure. In his constitution, Haile Selassie claimed that he was um, sacred and that his power was indisputable because God had chosen him as the ruler of Ethiopia. And in that constitution, I wasn't able to touch on this in my article, it got cut out because of the word length, um, but Haile Selassie claimed that uh, no member of the royal family could belong unless they were Orthodox Christian. So if you were Protestant, if you were Muslim, if you were something else, you were immediately um, estranged from the family. He claimed that every religious uh, gathering in Ethiopia needed to mention his name. So you, you see this weaving together of church and state in order to actually gather and worship God, you had to begin by mentioning the emperor. And after Haile Selassie, there have been these revolutions in Ethiopia that have moved towards um, what we would call religious freedom in Ethiopia, but we continue to see this pattern of the ruler claiming this unique relationship with God, claiming an unquestionable status, and using Christianity to mobilize their power agenda in Ethiopia. And the result, um, among other factors, is increasing conflict, suffering, and death in Ethiopia today, um, because the heart of religious nationalism or Christian nationalism is always power. Um, and so this is what my article is about and is asking people to reevaluate what it means for them to be Christian, what it means for them to be citizen. Does it mean claiming this kind of special privilege and trying to, um, have a kind of control over people in society or does it mean to be part of the community 
to serve one another humbly in love and to seek truth and accountability uh, no matter who's being criticized, no matter who's um, being shown to do good and right in Ethiopia. So this is, this is a little glimpse into the power of religious or Christian nationalism, John, but it's an ancient problem. And at the heart of it, it's humans doing human things. Uh, we could look at the Lord of the Rings, you know, that desire for power, that one ring to rule them all. And Christian nationalism has been used as that kind of ring to say, look, God is on our side. You can't question our leader. And we deserve special control, special privilege in our society because we are the new Jerusalem, the new Israel, God's chosen people, et cetera. So just to help uh, uh, American listeners and viewers, uh, uh, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life did uh, a survey uh, amongst Christians and noted that a high percentage think that in order to be considered, they, this is their phrase, a true American, one has to be, have a Christian identity. And so for many American Christians, that is an important part uh, of who they view themselves and how they view the country. In the context of Ethiopia, how important in this context is an Orthodox, capital O, identity in, in this process? Yes. So, John, it's very important to embrace complexity and to uh, um, hold a posture of humility. And we live in a time that is seeking easy answers and quick generalizations. Uh, this, is, this is the age of the sound bites of the tweet, uh, and that can be very dangerous. Uh, so I want to speak with complexity and humility and resist generalization. Let, let me say a couple things. The first is I know many Orthodox people who love Muslims and who seek relationships of respect and mutual belonging and um, the common good in society. What I mean by the common good is a space where everyone has equal rights under the rule of law, where everyone's well-being is equally sought out regardless of their faith or lack of faith, where people show each other basic respect and kindness. That said, when we look through um, the history of the Orthodox Church and some very, very prominent Orthodox leaders today, we see uh, a great Islamophobia. And I, I don't use that term you know, to be sexy and politically correct we see a, a deep suspicion of Muslims, a deep fear of Muslims, a resentment of Muslims, and a desire for Muslims to not have access um, to the same uh, public uh, standing and capacity to worship and pray as other Christians. And again, I think that this comes down to this idea of Ethiopia being a Christian nation. And so when you set up your the vision, your vision of society like this, it's inherently competitive. If we are Christian and other people are non-Christian and they're wanting an equal participation in our society, then they must be our rivals. They must be held in suspicion. They must be dangerous. For example, there's a very famous Ethiopian ruler from the late 19th century and early 20th century named Menelik II. He famously, um, sent a letter to the rulers of Europe at the time and claimed that Ethiopia was a Christian island in a sea of pagans. And he claimed that the, the kind of border regions around Ethiopia that had become Islamic uh, would be reconquered by the mercy of God. Um, and I think that this, this consciousness of Ethiopia as a Christian nation that is trying to take back land um, that that is currently under the control that that is largely inhabited by Muslims um, is is an aspiration among some, and again we see this among some very extreme and bigoted Orthodox leaders who would say that Muslims are not Ethiopian, that Muslims are inherently demon possessed, um, that Muslims are inherently untrustworthy and dangerous people, and I would just like to say for 
um, any of my Ethiopian listeners out there that I, I realize that this is not unique to Ethiopia. For example, I have uh, American Christian friends who believe that all Muslims are demon possessed, that all Muslims are dangerous, and that the United States um, should not accord the same public rights to Muslims that Christians want for themselves. So uh, I'm not trying to exceptionalize Ethiopia. This, this is a challenge that we Christians are wrestling with in different contexts. Exactly. Now, your article also mentions the evangelical movement and Pentecostalism. And in the context of Pentecostalism, you mention uh, Dominionist uh, and Seven Mountain theology, which interestingly is also factored into uh, the American Christian nationalism in regards to Trump. Can you speak to What's going on with the place of evangelicalism and Pentecostalism in the Ethiopian context? Yes, so you alluded to a, a, a previous podcast that you had uh, with someone studying dehumanization. I don't know if that was David Livingstone Smith. Yes, it was, yes. Okay, it sounded like it. <laughs> so David's research is really powerful and really important. And something that David has pointed out in his books, especially his recent book on inhumanity, is that when a society or a group of people begins to feel vulnerable, when they begin to feel under threat, when they begin to feel like they're losing some of their power and their privileges, it becomes very normal for humans to start looking for savior figures. We want somebody to defend us, to protect us, um, to save us from our enemies. So in the discourse of Trump today, we get this very, very, um, interestingly Christian language, save America. It's a messianic project. If you get behind me, I will save you. I will save the country that you love. I will deliver you from what you fear. Um, this is a political idolatry. It's the idea that a political figure can do something that only God can do, and that's save people. We see a very, very similar dynamic, John, in Ethiopia today. And this shows how, you know, there are these global trends that are happening around the world. We see something very similar happening in Russia today with Putin. Um, in Ethiopia, it's happened around this, this uh, political leader named Abi Ahmed. Um, Abi is a young, charismatic um, Ethiopian politician. He is a, a Pentecostal. Christian, his mother was Orthodox, his father was Muslim, but he converted to uh, Pentecostalism in his 20s. And when he was appointed Prime Minister of Ethiopia in 2018, it was a time of great vulnerability. Um, I can't give the full context now, but there were many nationwide states of emergency. There were mass arrests, there were mass killings. We were increasingly seeing public executions, people being lynched in public, burned alive in public. Um, very horrific and heartbreaking communal conflict that left millions of people homeless. And so when Abi came to power, many people saw him as a savior. And we saw this, you know, social media is so important, um, especially in Ethiopia. We saw many people putting um, frames on their, on their Facebook profile pictures saying, Abi, save our country. There are t-shirts and hats and essays and sermons being preached and prayers being prayed that Abi was the new Moses that was going to lead the people of Ethiopia out of their their slavery of the past that Abi was a, a new King David that was going to raise up the monarchy and receive God's favor for this kind of eternal kingdom um, and and what we saw was that, evangelical leaders got extremely, how shall I say this in a friendly way, um, they got extremely entrapped by this promise that if you mobilize behind Abby and if you promise your loyalty to him that you will receive favor from the state. And we know that this is a, a back and forth relationship. Religious leaders carry a lot of authority and credibility in the community. And of course, 
the politician wants that in order to build their base and to secure their constituency. So if the religious leaders are seen in public taking pictures and eating meals and smiling with the prime minister, he's getting some of that public credibility. And he in turn is promising to them uh, his favor. Maybe they're getting plots of land for their churches. Maybe they're getting business deals at the palace. Um, there's a very complex back and forth relationship taking place here. And the result, John, that I think is most relevant is this. We have seen a civil war raging in Ethiopia for 20 months. Uh, researchers estimate that upwards of 500,000 people have been killed. Of course, what is happening in Ukraine is extremely devastating and heartbreaking, but it doesn't compare to the scale of what's happened in Ethiopia. We see around a million people in famine. That means that they are in danger of starving to death. We see um, over 5 million people who have lost their homes. Um, I'm doing this interview in the apartment where Lily and I live right now. I'm very grateful for a secure place to stay. 5 million of our Ethiopian sisters and brothers have lost this in this war. And what deeply grieves me, John, and breaks my heart is that Christian leadership has been almost entirely silent about this. And the reason is very clear. They have gotten close to power. They have established a, rela a relationship with with the executive leader behind this escalation to civil war. And if they raise their voice, they know that they will be punished. That's how the game is played. And everybody knows it. And so what you see is one of the most catastrophic moments in Ethiopian history, combined with a deafening silence of moral leadership in our Christian community. John, this is a time that is crying out for Christian moral leadership. Uh, to cry out for peace, for human dignity, for reconciliation, to cry out for basic compassion and grief with those who are brokenhearted. We have heard almost none of this. In fact, we've heard the opposite of religious leaders continuing to fan the flames of how God is on the side of Prime Minister Abiy, that God is secretly using him to raise up Ethiopia and make Ethiopia great again and to um, overcome this sense of vulnerability that many Christians have felt and show that God is on their side and that revival is taking place in the church. So we see this kind of coming together of very perverse things. And I use that language of perversity intentionally. We see claims of revival, of blessing, of God moving and restoring some kind of past glory we see women raped, we see children hungry, we see elders homeless, and we see a country um, in one of the most devastating conflicts of its multi-thousand year history. So this is what's at stake when Christian sisters and brothers are entrapped by Christian nationalism. In your article, you say that 2018 was a turning point <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about why that was, and have you seen this lead to do you take that next step? We mentioned David Livingstone Smith. Has it de has it led to dehumanization? Do you see that taking place, and are you fearful that if these trends continue, that we might lead to uh, some kind of genocidal possibility in Ethiopia? Yes. Um... You know, there's, there's tears welling up in my eyes right now, John. And I, I want to say that, um, you know, this isn't a political analysis for me. This isn't a, uh, some kind of intellectual game. People's lives are at stake. That's the gravity, that's the sobriety of this conversation right now. I already mentioned that there was increasing anarchy in Ethiopia building up to 2018. We had these uh, nationwide protests. The government responded with brutal crackdowns. We had states of emergency, mass arrests, mass killings, um, increasing atrocities, communal displacement. So 2018 was the moment when the former prime minister, 
his name is Haile Mariam Dessalane, resigned. And in his place, this leader, Abi Ahmed, that I mentioned, was appointed by the parliament to replace him. And this is the beginning of what I mentioned of many Ethiopians seeing Abi as the savior figure who would deliver Ethiopia from this increasing anarchy and restore the greatness of Ethiopia. And he, um, Dr. Abi, is a follower of what is called the prosperity gospel. Now, this is very powerful in the United States. A lot of this theology was actually imported from the United States, but also Nigeria and other places. And this theology says that if you support your spiritual leader, um, and often money is involved, if you give money to your spiritual leader, you will get in line for the, the, the outflowing of God's blessing. And uh, you know, the leader is up here, and I'm down here, and if I position myself under them, and you know, God is above the leader, then God's blessing will trickle down from them to me, and I will receive, it's usually three things, health, wealth, and winning. I'll become um, prosperous financially, I will be healthy in my body, and I will have victory over my enemies. Um, and Abi is a strong supporter of this ideology, and he actually named his political party the Prosperity Party. And one of the really problematic dimensions of this theology, John, is that it completely silences critique and accountability of the ruler. So if God is up here, and the ruler is here, and I'm down here, if I start asking questions of the ruler, I'm gonna start blocking my access to the blessing that comes from God. And so many people have bought into this heresy and it has silenced their capacity to think critically about what Abby is doing and, and the trends of what his speech and action is, is taking Ethiopia. And let's take this to dehumanization. Abi claims to have a PhD in peace studies from the Institute for Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa University. This is uh, the most respected university in Ethiopia. It's the oldest university in Ethiopia. It's commonly known that Abi did not write his doctoral dissertation. Someone else wrote it for him. Uh, Dr. Abi was also awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018 for um, important peacemaking work that he was doing with Eritrea. So we would think that Abi would know the basics of peace and security theory and practice. But what we have seen is that Abi has, um, he has inflamed and mobilized dehumanizing rhetoric. So he's referred to his Tigrayan enemies, uh, Tigray is the region in the north where where a lot of the focus of the civil war has been. There's about six or seven million people up in Tigray. Um, and the, the fight between the federal government is with the regional government of Tigray. Abi has referred to his Tigrayan enemies as weeds, as demons, as cancer. Um, there have been numerous dehumanizing terms that are used. Now, John, if I can, go back to the Lord of the Rings. Um, when we watch the Lord of the Rings, most of us are not disturbed when we see, you know, Legolas beheading the, the orc or the goblin or their bodies being piled up and burned in a bonfire. Uh, we may even laugh you know, at the theatrical killing that takes place in these movies. And the reason is very simple. We don't think of the orcs as human. We think of them as less than human. Here's the impact. When we start thinking about the enemy as a weed, you just pull them out, no problem. When you think of them as a cancer, you just cut them out, no problem. When you think of them as a demon, you just drive them away, no problem. Or if you think of them as a dog or a hyena or a snake, you kill them and burn them. Now, this is exactly what we see in, happening in Ethiopia today um, with absolutely heart-shattering normalization, John. And um, 
Genocide Watch, which is a respected uh, res research organization, places Ethiopia in stage nine of genocide. That's elimination. That's the second to last stage where people are being mobilized to try to wipe out other people and stage 10. And stage 10 is denial. Denial is always the final stage of genocide. That's when the perpetrators say, no, we didn't do that. That didn't happen. Um, the Western media is making this up. Our enemies are telling lies about us. In fact, we are the sufferers, we are the victims. And what I wanna point out, John, uh, with, no, with no happiness at all, with great sorrow is that Prime Minister Abiy, the executive leader of Ethiopia, is responsible for fanning this dehumanizing rhetoric. And as Professor Livingstone Smith has demonstrated, you know, unquestionably in his research, dehumanizing rhetoric is the gateway to genocidal violence. Every time we can see it in Rwanda, um, where people were referred to as cockroaches. We can see it in Nazi Germany where people were referred to as rats. Uh, we can see it in the Bosnian genocide. Um, we see it happening in Ethiopia today. And so um, as a Christian, I believe that each and every person is made in the image of God, including the people I don't like, including the people I intensely disagree with. I believe that Jesus has commanded me to love my enemy and to do good to those who persecute me. This is not because Jesus was liberal. This was because Jesus loved God. Jesus said, God is the lover of the enemy. And so for us to be children of God, we need to behave like our father. Enemy love is the family resemblance of God's children. Um, and so it is very heartbreaking to me that an evangelical leader with a very strong evangelical base is using the resentment of the past. That's what I described in 2018 to start using this genocidal rhetoric that has led to civil war. And, you know, what I can call collective punishment and mass atrocity in various regions of Ethiopia, in Tigray, in Afar, in Amhara, in Beni Shangul, in Oromia, in Somali, in the South, and other regions. I like to. I'd like to try and. This has been a very somber uh, conversation. Before we talk about your book, I'd like to try and introduce something positive. Can you say a, a few things about what positive steps might be taken to improve this situation? How can Christians get involved in improving rather than contributing to what's going on there? Yes, yes. We must remain committed to hope, John. Uh, we must be people of hope. You know, uh, uh, many people have called themselves prisoners of hope, and that is the true, if ironic, freedom to be a prisoner of hope. Um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said that the church is called to be the conscience of society. And I believe that Christian leaders of Ethiopia today, Orthodox, Protestant, Pentecostal, they can still raise their voice and be the conscience of society for a peaceful, inclusive, healing Ethiopia. Now, this is an abstract, John. I think the message is very basic. Number one, resist othering. Othering says that the other person, the other group, the other religion, the other political party is unrelated or less than ourselves. We need to resist othering by teaching the image of God. Whatever religion you are, whatever pol political affiliation you have, um, whatever ethnicity you may be from, you are made in the image of God and you have precious value. You are connected to me and you are equal in worth with me and my group. And this um, drains the gas tank of dehumanization. Because remember, dehumanization depends on the idea that you are less than human. So if I say, uh, nope, John is not my enemy. John is not a weed. John is not a cancer. John is not a demon. I deeply disagree with John, but he has the image of God. He is my neighbor. He is created and loved by the savior of the world. 
what does that do? That unlocks our capacity to have dialogue. Now, violence is what happens when we lose the words to talk meaningfully to, to one another. And, and when we rediscover the sacredness of human life through, through neighbor love, we rediscover that language to say, what are our shared values? Is it truth? Is it freedom? Is it equality? Is it respect for rule of law? Is it mutual security, mutual dignity? Once we clarify our shared values, we can start talking about our shared practices. Okay, how do we get to those shared values? How do we implement them and embody them in a very complex and very polarized space? How do we begin inching towards some kind of acknowledgement of the atrocities that have happened? Some kind of accountability for the atrocities that have happened? Some kind of reparation for the atrocities that have happened? This reparation will probably not be financial. Um, it may be through some kind of monuments or documentation or opportunities for people to meet together in public and simply weep together and to express their grief. Our Christian, Muslim, and other moral leaders can do this work of saying, we are not enemies, we are neighbors. We can speak to one another. The basis of that speaking or that dialogue is our shared values and practices. And then let's figure out how to do this. Um, and I'm not, as an as a American friend and brother of Ethiopia, I'm not gonna prescribe what that should look like. But the religious leaders can take us beyond that first essential mountain. And that is othering dehumanization and these genocidal trends by saying, each and every person has precious value in the eyes of God. Let's seek dialogue. That's all very helpful. And we'll include links to your article and uh, <clears throat> your, your work uh, with the Neighbor Love Project and all of that. With just a couple minutes left, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your forthcoming book, Why Pray? Seven Practices of Flourishing on the Edge of Faith. What can you tell us about that? Thank you, John. You know, a lot of people around the world are really disenchanted with Christianity right now. And I think that this, this conversation helps us understand why. They've seen that a lot of Christianity is tied up with power, uh, with seeking some kind of Christian nationalism. And I think that a lot of people, especially a lot of young people, want something better right now. And what I'm trying to do in this book is show that um, Jesus gave us a prayer that is asking the fundamental questions at the heart of our humanity and praying this prayer can lead us in a practice of human flourishing that takes us to um, a really resilient and beautiful and, and extraordinary uh, maturity. So I suggest that Jesus is asking questions and answering them in prayer. So who is God, our Father? And the father that Jesus describes in his teaching, as I said, is an enemy lover. So I call this a practice of divine belovedness. God is the one who says, John, you're my beloved child. I delight in you. Andrew, you're my beloved child. I delight in you. Uh, Jawar, you're my beloved child. I delight in you. Abby, you're my beloved child. I delight in you. Um, the second movement is how should we talk about God. We've talked about how religious language can be weaponized for the sake of Christian nationalism. Jesus says, hallowed be your name. Now, this is a practice of radical reverence. It's to admit that we don't know God's name, that we can't control God's name, that we can't weaponize God's name for human power. The third, what do you want? Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I call this a practice of prophetic imagination. It's way different than the than the kingdoms that our Christian nationalists are fighting for. It's a kingdom of mutual love and service, nonviolence, prophetic witness. There's a lot in that chapter. How do we start over again? Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us as we forgive those who have sinned against us. This is a practice of courageous healing, of prioritizing people over pain. Forgiveness is the act of letting go of the pain that people have caused us and holding on to them as a precious neighbor. 
Um, but, you know, all of this can get a little lofty uh, and, and a little messianic. So Jesus asks the question, how much is enough? And he teaches us to pray, give us today our daily bread. I call this a practice of subversive simplicity. Our daily bread is enough. Um, this is a practice that leads to um, a lot of empathy and a lot of interdependence between people. The sixth, can violence save us? Jesus teaches us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I call this a practice of premeditated nonviolence. It's a practice of centering oneself in distressing situations and being ready to be composed and creative when the conflict begins. And the final practice takes us home. Um, can you let go of power and prestige? Jesus teaches us yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And John, this might be the crucial one for Christian nationalism. The kingdom and the power and the glory are not ours. Uh, control, influence, domination, prestige, clout, uh, fame, greatness. Uh, Jesus says, let go of these things and give them back to God. Um, this is the life of true freedom when you can say, I don't need to be addicted to these things. I don't need to fight and kill and live in competitive relationships to feel important. I can let it go. So I call this a practice of ultimate surrender, and it takes us back to our Father when we let go of these things and give them to God. It's the one who calls us beloved that we're giving it to. So I hope that this book, John, um, can show a better way to readers than the Christian nationalism that has made them very, very tired of Christianity, and understandably so. Well, it sounds like a fascinating book, and that there'll be a link in the program notes to your book as well. And Andrew, it has been uh, fascinating to, to learn about your work and uh, to learn more about this tragic situation in Ethiopia. I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast. John, you've asked fantastic questions and you're putting your finger on things that are extremely important. Thanks for your leadership. Thanks for your voice. Thanks for your hospitality. Thank you so much. And again, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. Look in the program notes for uh, more links and information about uh, Andrew's fine work. My thanks to everybody for listening and viewing. Until the next episode.